Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM. Today we've got future focused, interesting guy who's been around, done quite a few things and has a, yeah, has a zebra that's dead in his background. We've got Clay Collins. Thanks for coming today, Clay. Yeah, that's a, that's a, an Ikea rug, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely there. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me uh, on the show. Yeah, thanks for coming back on. I got to say, I love your podcast. I love what you've been doing. I, I hear you guys are doing great things, but I wanted to, I wanted to kick off the podcast with a, a hard question. Mm-hmm. What's harder, raising twins or building a venture scale business and exiting it? Oh, oh, definitely. It's bu- it building a venture scale business. Yeah, I, I you know, I've, I've heard people say things like, um, you know, relationship will be the hardest thing you ever do or being a parent. And I, you know, I think a lot of that is just sort of, sort of the fundamentals of being or trying to be a good person, you know, love your kids, pay attention to them, you know, same, same with relationships, N- know what you're getting into, be very clear about expectations. Uh, you know, a, a lot of that stuff, those things I think pale in comparison <laughs> <laughs> to starting a, a, a be careful your wife might be listening business. yeah i'm not saying i'm not saying that the business is more important i'm just saying that uh it's it's harder let's just look at the odds there's a lot more people that have kids and have twins than build successful venture businesses yeah i mean even with like the huge failure rate for marriage uh it's still 50 percent like if, if startups had a 50% uh, success rate or even just small businesses, uh, we'd be in a very different place as an economy. We would be in a very different place. And I think we'll talk a bit about the economy in a bit, but sure. blockchain, how'd you get into it? What's the story? When did you go down the rabbit hole, so to speak? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was uh, in, in 2013, there was a guy who now like runs security for Facebook or some part of it and uh cloud infrastructure there i don't know he's done a few different things and he was really into it and he explained it to me and it just made sense Uh, you know i I really enjoy economics i tell i tell people i really enjoy computers and money and this like brought them together but uh let's just say economics and uh and computers and, and it brought them together i immediately got it everything like all the high growth opportunities that have been created for investors have have come through really the the digits the digitization of of uh, previously analog assets so one example that's used quite frequently is the fact that instagram when it sold to facebook was worth more than kodak was at the time like by by a huge market by a huge margin um same with music so we've got moore's law the the doubling of of computational power every 18 months and that is this wave that every other technology can, can surf, right? So there's just been technology after technology that's hopped on the back of Moore's, Moore's Law, um, you know, resulted in digitization of, of something that we already know, like, and use. And uh, it's led to uh, new, new and amazing opportunities, right? And then, and then there are these emergent properties that come from the digitization of that thing. So, um, so I've been, I've been passionate about, I think, uh, Bitcoin for some time. I, I, I am a believer that every time the government prints money, they're stealing from holders of USD. Uh, it's like, it's like 2% so I think the biggest it's like 2% a year. It's unreal yeah, it's, how much money it it's, is. Yeah. It's, it's 2% a year and it's not like Bitcoin where this hasn't been around very long. This is 2% a year, you know, compound for a gajillion years. So it's 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 not a great thing and when money's printed it it usually goes to to banks it doesn't go to uh the lower or the middle class working people and uh the thing about money is when it's inflated whoever gets to spend that money first gets uh you know gets to benefit from having the money to spend without the impact of the inflation taking hold in fact every successful person who spends that money gets less and less value out of spending the printed money so um, yeah, so there's, there's just so many aspects of, of Bitcoin that I, that I appreciated and, um, you know, learned about Ethereum and uh, a whole bunch, a ton of other projects after that and um, became really passionate about the way the world was changing and this opportunity to opt out of, of, of so many things. Yeah, I've, I've heard um, Andreas, and, and Andreas, I, I won't try and pronounce his last name 
talk about the separation of like, instead of the separation of church and state, the, the separation of, of money and state. And that's something I'm, I'm a big believer in. So yeah, it's been, it's been a fun journey. And uh, I, I, I really do think that decentralized government go- governance and this new form of money is allowing folks to opt out of the traditional systems. And um, so I think the future is bright. I think it's super interesting as well. If you guys are interested in this, by the way, go to fringe.fm slash YouTube. I just did a live stream today on blockchain and cryptocurrency, but looking at looking into those, would you consider yourself a libertarian? Oh, I mean, there's that is such a loaded term. I, 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 uh, I believe that uh, if something doesn't harm others, you should be able to do it. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I guess according to that definition, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. Um, I think modern libertarians are some, you know, often associated with like, you know, the, the tea party. Um, I, I'd say I'm, I'm, um, uh, monetarily and economically very libertarian and, uh, and I'm also, I would say I'm socially very libertarian. I think, uh, I think if something makes you happy, it's not hurting other people then uh, like maybe you don't have to worry about it. It's like, ruining the sanctity of marriage or whatever other thing you think is being ruined. Oh, is this going to be like the Joe uh, Rogan podcast? Are you going to be Elon and light up? Are, no. are we going to, are we going to go there? No. <laughs> oh, oh Lord, oh Lord. I do. I do have a uh, CBD oil, which has no, no, uh, no THC in it or hallucinogenic property. So I do have like some, some uh, CBD vaping stuff over there, but uh, I don't, I don't think anyone's going to care if I vape CBD oil, hundred percent legal CBD oil. You rock that and I'll rock some MCT oil coffee and get the ketone kick. So what, uh, you're, you've been doing a lot. You've been very involved in the industry, in the blockchain space since a super successful career before that. We'll jump into that a little bit in the evolution of the internet. But what have you seen since 2013? We've seen some highs, we've seen some lows. People aren't all that excited now. Where do you see the space? Yeah, wow. Um, so I think what we're seeing is just is just uh, hyper tokenization. Um, you know, I think most people's interest is is in in sort of the the public discourse is around price movement, and I, I think that's interesting. Obviously, I hold some of this stuff. I want it to go up, and uh, I, I think tokens going up funds a lot of cool innovation and, and projects. But I think that um, you know what I th- I think when I first started, there was this talk about this being a new asset class. And, um, you know, I think where we sit today, I don't, I'm seeing less and less people talk about that. I, I personally don't think it's a new asset class. Like the asset classes are like debt, money, equity, you know, and all, all these things, uh, there's probably another thing I'm not thinking about, but like all these things, you know, can be tokenized. Um, so just because sort of value is taking another form that makes it very liquid and has all these other really cool properties doesn't mean it's a new asset class. I don't, I, again, I don't think it's a new asset class. Um, but, but I'm, I, I think with price movement being what it is, I, I think I see just a lot of people building. Um, I'm seeing this flight of talent leave Silicon Valley and leave traditional startups and go to the crypto space. You don't have to look very far to see just incredible engineers and entrepreneurs and product people leaving like vertical SaaS businesses and uh, becoming attracted to the space. Um, I think we're seeing for the very first time open blockchains that uh, anyone can analyze. Like it's, it's almost impossible to get a, you know, a transaction history of USD, right? But these public blockchains can be mined and um, all kinds of really interesting data can be pulled from them. And that's, that's really cool. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it, the, the story is really about hyper tokenization. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing real estate being tokenized. We're seeing securities being tokenized. We're seeing funds being tokenized. We're seeing, um, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing equity being tokenized. We're seeing tokenized debt on things like Dharma. We're seeing, uh, you know, t- tokenized uh commodities, whether they're like sort of physical instantiations of commodities or commodities like computing power that's being tokenized. And I I think that uh, liquidity just always finds a way to win. And uh, so so I I think probably the headline really is around uh, hyper tokenization. 
and um, you know maybe market caps have leveled off, but the rate at which new things are being tokenized continues to to increase. You know, there's uh, like whether it's derivatives, debt, whatever. Like this is this is happening, and it's here to stay. Or we're not going backwards, at least. How do you think about liquidity? So you, you built a very successful business, lead pages. You built it, you raised a little money, you, you raised a decent amount of money. You sold it, you made even more money. But what do you think would sell. be- No, 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 I transaction. Tra- I, we hired our COO and he's crushing it and it's- Oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it continues to grow, it's, it's awesome. So like there hasn't been, uh, like there hasn't been an exit, but uh, it's, it's a nice business and it's growing. Well, it's um, still relevant. How do you think about liquidity? I imagine there were highs and lows both for you and for the investors. I know I don't see a lot of Bitcoin billionaires because people couldn't hold on to Bitcoin long enough. They had to go buy a pizza because they were worried it was going to go down. What do you think about liquidity in terms of incentivizing short-term thinking versus long-term thinking? Oh, I mean, I, I think, I think liquidity is one of those things where there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be caps on him on liquidity in place merely because of like the structures are in place or the, the technological limitations that are in place or regulatory limitations that are in place. So, um, you know, what's cool is that a tokenized asset can, it can be liquid, but smart contracts and rules can be in place to make it uh, not, not so liquid. So uh, it's, it's, it's about, you know, is, is something voluntarily or involuntarily illiquid? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I prefer things that are voluntarily illiquid and that become, can become liquid whenever someone wants them to be. So, wow, I, I have a lot of thoughts on, on liquidity. I think perhaps starting with, with, uh, with disclosures. I, I think a lot of people are talking about uh, tokenizing their company without considering how much disclosure is actually required to get price discovery, like very efficient price discovery on those tokenized assets. So like, let's say you're a coffee shop and uh, you want to tokenize equity in your business. Well, in order for that, that token to trade on exchanges, like people need to know how much you're making. And at least on a quarterly basis, they need to have insight into how the business is operating, what hires are looking like, you know, balance sheet, all, all this kinds of stuff. And it's really expensive to prepare those kinds of disclosures, right? Um, especially if you can potentially be sued if they're incorrect, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I think, um, I, I don't know that it's practical for, for every single company. I, I also think that there's, uh, a lot of lack of illiquidity that's just creating for really that's resulting in really grumpy boards. Like if you're an investor and you invested in a company and you want to get out, like in most cases, or I'd say in many cases, the company wants that investor out because they're just, they're not, they're not fun to work with anymore. They're grumpy. They don't want to be there. They'd rather take, you know, whatever money they can off the table and leave. And usually the entrepreneur wants them off the board because they, you know, they don't, they don't want them voting. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm for liquidity uh, when it makes sense. And there's, there's, there's just, I think there's various forms of liquidity. I think it exists on a scale. Um, and, uh, all, you know, on one end is like, there's no liquidity at all. Something can't be sold. And on the other, on the other end of this, you know, spectrum is like super deep mar- markets and, lots of disclosure and really efficient price discovery and stuff. And then there's, there's a whole lot of gray area in the middle. You know, sometimes the only liquidity you're looking for is that there's an investor and they have $50,000 worth of stock in a company and they know someone who wants to buy it and they just want to sell it to them and they can't, you know? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so there's a gradient, but I, I, I think about, um, I think about the desire for liquidity of, or valuable assets is kind of like, you know, tributaries to something like the Mississippi River, like, like the water will forge a path <laughs> to, you know, to lakes and streams or, you know, where, wherever it needs to go, like liquidity will find a way to, to access the greatest uh, pool of liquidity possible. And uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a natural law or something. It will, but is the the question is is that a good thing? So I've seen I've seen polls. It's somewhere between sixty to eighty yeah. percent of public market CEOs 
are willing to pass on investing in something they guarantee will have future growth to be able to make the short-term stock prices look better because that's how they're incentivized right. because of liquidity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it, it, I, I don't think liquidity is a binary thing. You can, you can put whatever protective measures you want in place. You can put whatever restrictions you want in place. You can have vesting, you can have cliffs, you can have like whatever you want to do, you can do it. So it's just, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about like, are, are the current systems in place, you know, are they voluntarily illiquid and are there ways to sort of uh, calibrate, you know, can you, can you open and close liquidity and sort of find that, that sweet spot on the liquidity spectrum. And, uh, that's just something that's not possible with, um, you know, stock certificates sitting on a shelf somewhere or, you know, whatever else yeah, folks are doing. Hard to restrict the movement of monopoly money. What do you think yeah. of government or corporations co-opting the, the crypto or the blockchain movement? Oh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that it can be co-opted. Um, you know, probably, I, I think, I think uh, markets want to be open. And I think that the control is so decentralized that uh, uh, over time, it's just going to be harder and harder for state actors to, to exert control in the space, especially if you've got all these like cantaker, cantankerous, uh, curmudgeon you know, anarchists and uh, crypto anarchists and libertarians who like bristle at anything you say to them on Twitter. Like these, these are not a group, you know, and many of them are heavily armed. So this is like, this is not a group of people that I think is uh, prone to be influenced by government. And, and there's so many different stakeholders. And, and uh, I think that the, the governance is so multifaceted and, and, uh, and, and complex. I, I just, uh, I don't, I don't think it's going to be, I don't know what you mean by co-op, but uh, are, are you talking about like sort of the state issuance of fiat currencies? Yeah, so a state issuance of digital crypto-esque currencies, whereby oh. whereby the kind of the cream of the crop, what everyone's shooting for, the global money supply, is no longer up for up for demand. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm like, you can't stop a government from printing money. So, I mean, I, I think I think I think what most governments will do with blockchain is going to be roughly similar to just how digital cash works right now. You know, you can log into your website, it's your bank's website and you can see a number on a screen and you can use Venmo and you can send it around. Um, you know, this, this stuff being digital isn't what's, you know, what, what differentiates it. It's, it's, it's uh, explicitly stated uh, monetary policies. It's, um, you know, confidentiality or pseudonymity. It's the fact that it's, it's hard money, right? So it's, it's. What if Switzerland launched one? They would be the perfect people. The neutral country. Switzerland, Switzerland prints money left and right, you know. But that's every only because time... everyone trusts. Swi so I, I've lived in, so everyone trusts Switzerland so much. The reason why they're printing so much money is the Swiss currency is overly inflated based off of where it should be. So they can yeah. print money, swap it to euros, wait for it to go back down and make a 40% return immediately. Right. Right. So, so like what I'm saying is that, you know, economic policies that are sort of hard coded in at the protocol level that can't be changed by anyone on a whim, like that is not going to fly. And you know, the, the second it doesn't fly, like what's the difference between, you know, Tether or Gemini's, you know, US dollar token or some of these stable coins and some government's fiat currency. Like there's none except sort of governmental fiat currency will probably track you and uh, there'll be no confidentiality and you'll be required to like dial home to spend it and uh, you'll have to authenticate certain addresses and uh and and you'll have to be on white lists in order to spend your money and they can seize it at any time and like all like all the stuff they need to do to be compliant with laws so like they just they they can't it's i don't think it's gonna work see i'm not disagreeing but i'm saying that people pretty much just throw away their privacy for another cat picture it's kind of what i've seen and it's it's disappointing yeah. Not the of not not uh, obviously not the crypto movement. People are very very right. secure with what they're doing. But in terms of general population, it's uh, 
troublesome yeah, to say I, the least. I, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, I, I don't think what, I think, you know, regardless of the underlying technology, I just can't see a government, um, like, in order for someone to switch from thing A that they've traditionally used, like whatever incumbent product they've, they've been using to something new, I think it has to be at least 10X better. And I just don't understand what would be 10X better about USD coin versus what's happening in the bank right now. Because I don't think the, I don't think the US government, like as a product organization could create a cryptocurrency that's notably better than what's happening right now. I would agree with that. I don't, I don't know if they would have to though, just like the history of marketing VHS one over Betamax, but it, it's a, it's, it's a no point. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. I'm curious as well. I very much hope that it goes the non-governmental route. I'm very much there with you. I'm no, like, what's the there. difference? So they, they, they create USD coin. What's the difference between that and what's in, in your bank? Like they can still inflate it. They can still uh, block your nothing's spin. Diff they nothing's can... different, but right now yeah. everyone's fine with fiat, except for people that understand what it actually is, which right. is a small percentage. Okay. Yeah, and it, like I think you have to be a per forward, a pretty forward-thinking company, to or or product organization to create products that like disrupt what you're already doing. So like it was pretty, uh, it was pretty cool that uh, Apple created the iPhone to disrupt the i the iPod. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they created the iPad, which, you know, disrupted other parts of their business. Like largely, I think mobile has disrupted, you know, much of their desktop business, uh, you know, for, for Apple. But you, I think you have to be willing to like create the evil twin version of whatever you're doing that could just crush it, right? So like if you're creating, um, you know, luxury brand A, then you need to create super, you know, like whatever's going to disrupt that. Uh, so, um, so the only way for a government to create a token that can appreciate more than the value of USD that isn't just absolutely pegged to the value of uh, USD is, is for them to do something that's like for them to create a token that's willing to disrupt USD. And I, I just don't see them doing it because now you've got to like figure out how you're going to denominate stuff at the governmental level. You have to figure out like taxes. You have to figure, you know, you've got two uh, quote currencies for everything you're doing. You have to denominate in, in, in two different ways. I just, I just don't think it's going to happen. I just, you know, I think there's lots of, uh, there's, there, there are some governments that innovate more than others, but usually the most innovative governments are not the largest ones. Like it's, it's probably, it'll come from Estonia or something. I don't Someone know. with less paperwork. How have you seen, uh, how have you seen the uh, internet industry trains? You've been involved for quite a while now. Uh, how have I seen the internet industry change? Like software, like startups or? Just overall the, the feel for the internet early on today, where we're headed. How have we seen the changes? Where do you see us headed? Not just for decentralization, but overall. Yeah, that's a, that's a, really, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, think, I think one of the most interesting developments is just the internet of things like the internet, it, it, the internet was, a was around for a long time before you could like hail a cab with it. <laughs> you know, there was TCP IP and HTML and CSS and JavaScript and like all these startups. And uh, like, you know, when you think about the internet coming out in the, the 80s <clears throat> and it takes all the way, you know, like 40 years later, you can hail a cab, right? Or like, you know, 35 years later, you can hail a cab or list your house on Airbnb. It, it took a long time for this stuff to in, insert itself into um, real world objects. And I think there's a parallel there, there to, um, to, to the blockchain space, right? Like m most of what's interesting with cryptocurrencies is just that like you can trade it and there's liquidity. And when I see people being like, yeah, we're gonna do blockchain for sub, you know, for like supply chain management, it's like, man, we can't even, we don't even have a decentralized domain name service yet. Like we don't even have decentralized storage that works. Like we don't have all these sort of digitally native things working yet. And, uh, and, and, and you think you're gonna do something with this new tech that interacts with like physical objects in the real world. Like we're, we're really, really, really far away from that in, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, we still need to build out all the pipes.
yeah. the road, the roads, the bridges. We, we need the bridge builders before we have the the skyscrapers. Yeah, I think another another thing that's happening, you know, is um, I think it's actually. I don't think it happened until like maybe the last 12 to 24 months where it's actually been feasible to be super productive as a remote worker. Like where the, the, the sort of what it, what it costs you in like kind of lower communication with the rest of your team hasn't been too burdensome. So I don't know if do you, do you still get on, hangouts with people and like their connection isn't good or the audio doesn't work or um if it's skype yeah yeah if it's skype i mean like voice over p voice over ip still isn't figured out so yeah i think you really you can really suffer by not being you know in a in a high in in the high bandwidth connection that is existing with someone in in, in meet space in real time but uh, i think it's actually starting to get to a place where you where you, you know, you don't have to be in San Francisco or wherever your company wants you to be and you can actually work from home and be, be really productive. And I, I don't think that was true three years ago. I, I think it's, it's just now starting to happen. So that's interesting. You know, it's, 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 this is kind of a difficult question for me to answer because I, I feel like it's, uh, it's like asking a fish who's lived in the ocean, like, you know, how, how has water changed over time? You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm so native to the space that, uh, thinking about sort of the the medium that is sort of the connective tissue of the internet it's it's getting harder and harder for me to do uh probably every year it's definitely become much more of a big boys game oh you mean on the the business side the business side the platform side the the control over attention and eyeball side oh i see yeah right um yeah, right. So we've got you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, the the fame companies, and and like those are the biggest companies in the world now, right? Like that wasn't true, or I guess Apple uh, is in that. You know that that wasn't true five years ago. So yeah, I, I think I think there was this idea that the internet would democratize, um, you know, the the ability to create a business, and that like power wouldn't become more and more concentrated and it has it has become concentrated but i really see the decentralization that comes with blockchain technologies being the antidote to that and although i think maybe more power is concentrated in like you know a handful of companies i do think that the internet has unlocked the ability for a world-class life coach for example or a world-class welder or a world-class creator of shirting uh in the in the middle of a small town in the midwest to earn a living so i I do think that the net has been far more positive than negative it isn't the utopia that everyone thought it would be but you know there are there are freelance writers who never would have the opportunity to write for a major publication that now are doing that as journalists so i think i think that the 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 benefits have been huge and have far outweighed the the negative aspects of this. Absolutely. I, I like Kevin Kelly's definition. Humanity is 51% good and 49% bad. So every year we get about 2% better. Just looking at that, just looking at the differences in terms of, yeah. No, wait, wait. So my, my, my favorite uh, quote about this, is uh, George Carlin, like people ask him about kids cause he thinks people fetishize children. And uh, there's this cult of the child, like somehow children have to all be good. And he's like, yeah, children are like any other group of people. A few winners, a whole lot of losers. <laughs> so I like it. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like any other demographic. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm going to stop now before I start saying things that could get me in trouble, actually. No worries. No worries. We won't send this to the wife. Um, so uh, my next question for you, what, uh, what technologies, what other areas outside of blockchain are you most excited about and why? Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I don't really know. Um, I don't really know. Uh, as a consumer, I really like 
the internet of things. I like my, my nest devices. I think what's happening with, uh, autonomous cars and, uh, autonomous vehicles is really cool. Like that's going to free up a whole lot of people's time who are commuting from place to place. And hopefully instead of, you know, taking cat photos or creating memes, like maybe they could get some more work done or, you know, write letters to their children or, you know, reflect on something. Right. So I think that's going to unlock a whole bunch of productive energy. Hopefully who knows. Um, but I, I really think, um, something that isn't talked. Oh, I think another big thing are excess capacity marketplaces. So this is a, this is a big thing. So, I mean, um, Airbnb is essentially an excess capacity marketplace, right? Like you've got inventory in your house. Maybe it's a room. It's not used most of the year. And now you can make money from that. Or, you know, when you think about, uh, um, you know, people's closets are filled with clothes that they don't use. And there's no, there's no liquidity around that clothing, right? It's just, they've got excess capacity and, and there's nothing they can do with it or autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah. Or, or just like the, the car you have right now you can, yeah, you can sign up with, with Uber and, and drive. And now sort of this, this, this thing that was pretty intensive to acquire in the first place and where there's like kind of quite a bit of capex associated with it, it it can actually be productively used and that means we don't have to have as many of them and you know we can save on resources so i'm 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 really i think the trend around excess capacity marketplaces is going to continue <clears throat> i think another god i've got a hold on hopefully you'll edit this I don't know what's going on. I've got some serious throat issues to clear. Um, no worries. I think another. Uh, I think another big thing is just the ability to very inexpensively get access to tools like Amazon Web Services. Right, like you get access to like serious computing power. Uh, I'm sorry, you get access to serious computing power and disk storage and like machine learning capabilities for, you know, essentially free if you're not deploying them at scale. And that's like, that's unheard of. Uh, I mean, that is really pivotal in, in the history of the world. Like the, the fact that there are these computational like utility companies that offer things like computing power and database storage and machine learning like you, like you right now could stand up infrastructure that could rival you know the New York stock exchanges are right, just going to like maybe Microsoft Azure and standing up a, a Cassandra instance right and that's absolutely amazing and empowering and uh, I think unlocks a lot of just a lot of really great ideas. It's, it, 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 it creates permissionless innovation. Um, yeah. So those, those are the things that come to mind. Yeah. Bringing the, bringing the cost of starting a company down, it's come down 10, a hundred X since the, the early internet days, which has changed the venture landscape, changed the investing landscape. I know you do, you do a fair bit of investing in funds and crypto and other things I imagine as well. What are you focused on from a from an ROI type perspective? What do you look into? What are you most interested in as an investor? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you know, I'm 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 generally interested in diversifying. I'm a big believer in that. I think. Um, I think the the biggest opportunity for growth far and away is is just like the M two money supply of the world. <laughs> which is at, uh, what is it, is it around? It's like seven trillion. No, it's more than that. Uh, that might be the M1 money supply. It's in the teens. Um, so M2 includes things like uh, like money market accounts and, and uh, stuff that's a little bit harder to get to, but still there. So like what's bigger than M2 money supply? I guess the bond market is, so like debt markets are. So like, you know, as an investor, I'm really interested in these huge macro trends, like replacing the M2 money supply, uh, replacing, you know, debt instruments and uh, owning a, a piece, 
uh, of those uh, of those networks uh, indefinitely. So I, I I think that's like that's probably the biggest opportunity outside of a company that you would start yourself that has the opportunity a thousand x or hundred. I mean, if like starts at nothing, then the ROI is infinite potentially. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just equity, debt markets, M2 money supply. It's what I'm most focused on. And what scares you these days? Um, it's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, I think that the world is becoming more polarized. I think that leaders are becoming a little bit more um, authoritarian. I think, you know, the ability to manipulate public opinion on platforms like Facebook and Twitter, like it's becoming easier to do. So I think that there's kind of this race against time. Um, I think we've got this centralized internet and that can result in a lot of really bad things if not properly monitored and regulated and then I think we've got the decentralized internet, which is also going to produce a lot of bad and good things. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, is, 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 is fair. At least I hope it will be uh, in, in its decentralization, right? Or at least markets will function properly and there, aren't, there won't be government bailouts and stuff. So I guess I'm, I, I kind of see this race of the centralized internet against the decentralized internet. And... I hope that the decentralized internet will like emerge victorious in a way that allows us to actually um, put resources behind the biggest problems in the world, like global warming and uh, well, mostly global warming, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think the centralized, I think if the, I, I think if the centralized internet persists, I think it's really going to be hard to make decisions in a way that actually allow us to solve collective active pro action problems like global warming. So like that's way out there, but um, I guess that's a fear. It is, but it isn't. I think, that's, I think that's a fear of a lot of people that have thought about this well. I have two last questions for you and then it's dinner time sure. right here. So sure. question one, if you had to invest 50% of your net wealth in one asset, one specific thing, it can be Bitcoin, US dollar, Amazon, you name it, what would it be and why? Oh, I mean, it would absolutely be Bitcoin. It, it, it would absolutely be Bitcoin. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's the hardest store of value that I know of. It's got the biggest uh, developer pool, the biggest, you know, sort of the largest network effects. Um, there's more people thinking about that than any other like single, you know, it's the largest coordinated uh, fintech effort in the world right now it's the it's, it's the world's largest uh network in terms of compute power uh so I, I put it into bitcoin um in terms of you asked about fears uh i'll, I'll just circle back to that too i think ai i think knowing what's going to happen with ai is is a big fear like where where is that going to go uh I, I already am starting to feel kind of abs obsolete as a as a human uh like it's, it's kind of a far out statement to say but i like when I interact with certain types of AI, it's very clear to me that, you know, I have short-term memory and it decays really fast and it's pretty faulty. And uh, like my ability to think straight and think productively like ebbs and flows and I need sleep. And uh, so like I think about my children and like how, how are we going to integrate with AI? Cause I think that's probably the, the most likely scenarios that we we integrate with it and uh i hope i hope as we integrate with it that we still find a way to uh to enjoy things like uh nature and uh breezes and uh the feeling of the sun against our skin and uh like these all these little moments i i, I hope uh i hope we aren't so like drugged up with the dopamine rushes of uh constant notifications and unlimited yeah uh, unlimited uh hits of whatever we want um, that like, I, I hope we don't lose the ability to sort of stand back and gain perspective on what's happening. And, and, uh, and I hope we, I hope we, we do, I hope we merge with AI the right way, not the wrong way. And I don't even know what those are. 
I think when people become overly productive, they lose the ability to be creative and to be happy. I think there's something tied to creativity and happiness, I would argue. I think productivity and creativity are inversely related. So you can't be very creative while you're very productive. You can't be very productive while you're very creative. They're diametrically opposed. I think AI is really? quite good at productivity. Mutually exclusive? I think, think they're, they're mutually, mutually exclusive. exclusive. Just you look don't at- think creative acts are productive? No, not at all. Usually when they're doing something, they're not trying to do something. They just feel the need to do it. It doesn't fill something. And I think you could, yeah. I think you could backdate it and say, wow, that was really productive. You worked really hard on that piece of art, but you produced a piece of art that's kind of, it has no meaning except for the meaning that people take from it. So hmm. that, that's kind of how I think about things. I think AI will be yeah. very good at the productivity side of things. I think humanity, at least for a while, will be the creativity side of things which will be a, a major flip from where we've been in, uh, yeah. in recent years. I, th I, think, I think we're probably just defining creativity differently. I think, you know, I know someone who writes, you know, beautiful algorithms and, and they, uh, they are productive. Um, and uh, like, I, I have a background as a writer and I think what I do when I write is very productive, you know, for my business. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I get the dichotomy, but, uh, to me, they're, they're the mm -hmm. same. I guess for me, productive is more rote tasks, but okay. it, it uh, is what it is. And our last sure. question, our last question, yeah. because apparently the twins have dinner and this is very important. Yeah. You got to yeah. get back to uh, the, totally. the, the all important. And I imagine incredibly hard. It's got to be really hard raising twins. How did you pull that off? You seem like a Zen dude. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, like we, we just have really, like really, so my wife is amazing um and uh we we have really great help and uh and we have resources and i think that makes all the difference in the world like i can't imagine doing this as a single parent with um you know in a, in a low income scenario so a, a lot of the stressors aren't there we're really blessed that's awesome last question what's one yeah. thing you want to leave people with it can be a quote a statement a call to action anything yeah. Um, yeah. So this is probably on the, on the more like woo woo side, but uh, I think, I think that uh, motivation is overrated. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's wise to instead, instead of thinking about like what you ought to be doing, I think it's better to start thinking about what you can't not do. You know, like um, if, if, uh, you know, if you, if, if you could do anything in the world, you know, what, what, you know, what, what, what can you not, you know, what can you can't not do? I, I don't know how to, I, but that's, that's what I would think about is, um, yeah, is, is just sort of where you're inherently drawn. All of the obsession. Uh, yeah. I mean, like you're just a lot more productive when you're focused on things that you're inherently interested in, like you don't have to think about productivity anymore. It's just sort of like what, where you're naturally inclined. So that's what I'd encourage folks to think about it. You know, I, it comes from a very like kind of privileged position and there's lots of people get up in the morning and um, like, I'm not going to argue for other people's limitations, but like their set of options are pretty limited. And uh, I just say, you know, expand your set of options <laughs> as much as you can incrementally. But um, no, I don't, I don't know that I know a lot about life. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of doing my best. And um, I'd say, uh, yeah, don't, don't try and hack your motivation. You know, skip all the planners <clears throat> and the timers and the crazy, you know, getting things done, scheduling systems and note-taking whatnot <clears throat> and morning routines and whatever ridiculous infrastructure people have in, installed to try and make themselves be productive, like make that go away. And, and then think about like, if I had to sit in a chair all day and uh, like, what would get me up? Right. So like at first, probably what would get you up is like, you have to go to the bathroom. Right. So like going to the bathroom is something that you can't not do. Right. But then if you go and sit back down, like what would be the next thing? All right. You might have to eat at some point. So you, you can't not eat. You have to eat. But then like maybe the next thing is um, you'd have a thought and you, you'd really have to write that down. Like you really, you can't stop yourself from, from writing that down. So follow that and, and see where it goes and uh, see where that kind of line of thinking uh, leads you. Uh, I think probably you said one, but I think the second, the second thing is really related. Um, 
I, I was really skeptical of meditation and then I started doing it every day and it changed my life. And um, there's no way to really explain what the impact is. Uh, there's fMRI studies and all that. People overcomplicate it. Just set a timer for like 15 minutes and sit somewhere. Like you don't even have to clear your mind or do anything. Just like sit with, without a phone you know, in a quiet place and do it every day and see if awesome shit doesn't happen. I would recommend find a guided meditation if it found, feels woo-woo for a bit. Listen to that, headphones, close your eyes. And uh, pro tip, if you smile, because as your emotions all start to go away, the only thing that you have left is a smile, which triggers positive emotions internally without any ability to change them. But I, I, love, what, I love both of those. So basically, focus on being a happier person and focus on, focus on your obsession. I think we're moving towards an era where people doing things for the purpose of manual, boring, pointless labor that no one else wants to do is going away pretty quickly. And only people that are going to succeed will be the ones who are able and willing to try something completely freaking outlandish that they're obsessed about doing because they'll be the ones that do it and do it best. That was very well said. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I also think there's like folks who obsess about really rote things and they really enjoy it like uh, ma making sushi or growing trees or you know what whatever whatever that thing is um i you know i'm 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 an entrepreneur because uh i can't really do anything else but uh i think there are people that turn you know they make being a librarian into an art or driving driving a cab i think uh i think happiness can be found in like really small places and uh, or big places who who am i to sort of size what those things are you know mm -hmm. so, it certainly doesn't come from items though clay thanks so much yeah. for coming on it's been uh it's been yeah. a ton of fun where's the best place for people to find you learn more oh probably twitter just uh at clay collins on twitter awesome I, I was remembering you as CDC on some reason for Twitter. So I was trying to tag you for something and then the Center oh, for yeah. Disease Control was popping up. But uh, yeah, awesome. yeah. we'll throw <laughs> links and everything right. in the show notes, guys. Fringe.fm. Fringe Thanks again, Clay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cheers.